Hello everybody and welcome to the Search Podcast. My name is Saad al and today we will be talking about COVID-19 and the OR. So I really tried to avoid talking about this topic, but um, I was recently asked to discuss it and to come up with, with a sort of literature review as a point of discussion. And, you know, I figured if we were struggling with it worldwide, people are asking the same question. And you know, I had a conversation on Twitter where we had similar concepts that we really wanted to cover, and I figured, why not? So, um, in interest of full disclosure, I've yet to operate on a patient who is corona or COVID-19 positive, but, and I'm sure that the vast majority of people I'm talking to right now have the same feeling of, I haven't done it, but I'm going to have to deal with it at some point. And so... Um, we're going to have to look at some examples where this is going to be relevant. So examples include things like uh, perforated DUs, highly unlikely, I agree with you. Chest tubes, slightly more likely given our ventilation strategies, right? At least what's coming out of uh, Europe. Tracheostomies. Older patients are at risk. Older patients take longer to wean. Older patients might benefit from tracheostomies. You could argue for or against, but they might benefit from tracheostomies. And when you look at the literature, it's not there yet, but I have absolute confidence that within the next two or three days, we're going to start to see declared guidelines or consensus guidelines. Because if I'm thinking about it, you're thinking about it, Twitter's thinking about it, everybody's thinking about it. And so somebody's going to come up with a definitive guideline that's going to make sense. But when you look at the literature right now, in general, for general surgery procedures or, or acute care procedures, I would contend that you should treat the patients not based on the level of evidence, but based on expert opinion, because we don't know that much yet. We're learning more and more every day, and I'm absolutely confident that everybody who's listening to this knows what they're doing. I'm pretty sure that the outcomes are excellent in your hands, okay? And the reason why is because we've seen this before. We've seen infections like this before. They may not spread the same way, but we've had to deal with these precaution issues before. You know when? It was TB. So it's, it's not nearly the same as TB, physiologically or pathophysiologically. But I would contend that, that it is the same as TB in terms of precaution principles in the operating room. And I based most of this talk on the three papers that I've quoted earlier, in addition to some of my own thoughts, which I will outline later on. So we already know about, from the last episode, uh, PPE, donning and doffing, right? Uh, personal protective equipment, how to wear it, how to take it off. Team dynamics, risk minimization, and resource management in general is what we're going to be talking about today. And the idea is to take these concepts of team dynamics, risk minimization, and resource management and steer them towards producing positive outcomes for patients, reducing cross-infection and contamination, and recognizing where the problem areas can be, right? So when we look at our typical OR prep time or our prep room, so effectively every operation involves four, pace, four phases. People say beginning, middle, and end. I don't know that. Preparation, intraoperative, postoperative, and follow-up. In the preparation, we're going to the stock room, we're getting drugs, we're getting the main OR sets, we're getting the secondary OR sets from the secondary stock rooms. We're opening up cabinets, we're closing cabinets, we're doing all of these things, and the patient's coming down, they're coming down from the isolation ward, they're going through a corridor, they're going through a bunch of different rooms, a bunch of different hallways, a bunch of different doors, doors that have to be handled by people. Intraoperatively, we're passing over equipment between us and our scrub nurse, our circulating nurse is going in and out of the room, she's getting us stuff, she's getting me the stapler that I need because I need the green stapler because I'm firing it off in the stomach and I don't need the blue stapler because I don't like the blue stapler, I need the 75 and not the, not the 100 etc etc and you can see where we're getting to here i hand off my specimen uh, they're in and out of the stock room they're trying to help me out they're going through the induction room because they figured the patient was already there and you know i'm going through these consumables and we're running out of stuff in the operating room and so therefore they have to go out again but finally i'm done the specimen gets handed over the specimen gets transported independent of the patient post-operatively and we move on to our post-operative phase 
Anesthesia is awakening the patient. They're grabbing the chart, which was in the room, and in direct contact with the patient. They're writing notes in the chart frantically. They're using the same pen that they've used for the last three patients, and they're going to use for the next three patients. They're monitoring the patient. They're making sure that all the vitals are there. So they're touching their touch screen, just as I'm putting on the dressing, and I've taken off my first layer of gloves because that's the right thing to do when you're putting on the dressing. And I always double glove because I'm a trauma surgeon, and you never know what's going on. Put the specimen in the right box. The specimen gets transported by a different person than the person who's handling the patient. And now we have two different groups of PABs or porters running around. And we're ordering post-operative investigations that have to be handled by a different nurse than the nurses that were circulating with me. The equipment itself has to, which is now contaminated by the way, has to go through CSST into the sterilization process. The specimen gets transferred to pathology and the patient goes to the recovery room. Right? And then we go through the follow-up phase. The follow-up phase involves the patient being transferred through a completely different set of hallways, maybe, potentially, or the same set of hallways. goes all the way up to the ward. You get rounded on for pain, pain control, etc. You get your wound check. For me to do the wound check, I have to go in and out of the supply room. And all of a sudden, you're seeing that this complex system that is designed to be as efficient as possible at... Transferring a patient over, getting the surgery done as quickly as possible, is the least efficient system for infection control purposes. It's a system that involves using 13 different rooms. I can count them off if you want, or 13 different areas, let's say. So patient's isolation ward, corridor, doors, or entryway into the operating room or the, the pre-op area, the pre-op area itself, post-operative area, the anteroom or the induction room, the operating room itself, the post-operative recovery room, the scrub room, we're not going to count. Let's pretend it's not there. The pathology lab, the stock control room, the doctor's lounge, because you took the chart down there, right, to finish your notes, okay? The... Um, CSST room, sterilization rooms, okay? And in addition to that, and you cannot deny it, the changing room. 13 different areas of potential contamination. So our paradigm that we typically use involving five different roles has to be cleaned up and it has to be optimized for cross-infection control purposes. And the first stage is to have a segregated code or not co-team, but corona team, with its own set of anesthetists and techs, its own set of surgeons, its own scrub nurses, its own runner, and its own circulating and charge nurse, who are in a position where they not only can work hard, but are interested, and probably some of the slickest people that you have. And they're extremely adept at doing drills. And they're extremely adept at training people. And what they have to be involved in is first drilling amongst themselves and debriefing the process that we're going to discuss today, which you will modify. I guarantee you. Nothing that I'm saying here is perfect. This is all consensus statement review articles and me thinking out loud. So by no means is it ever going to be perfect. But you're going to modify it, and they're going to be in PPE the whole time that they're in contact with the patient, and they're going to drill it significantly. Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So the one thing I will contend is the only area where you can potentially avoid contamination is the stock control room and the staff lounges. Everywhere else, your only option is to have a segregated contaminated area. So a segregated contaminated pre-OR anteroom. And I would prefer if the patient went straight into that room instead of going to a pre-OR area. So the pre-OR phase... And the anteroom induction phase happen in unison in the same area. Okay? The pre-OR anteroom has the runner going for stock control and the lounge into that room only. There are no trolleys that enter or leave that room except for the patient's trolley. There is a trolley in that room that acts like a bridge or a go-between. Whenever the runner goes into that room or leaves, they have to wear the full PPE in the manner outlined in the last episode and towards the end of this episode, okay? The runner is the only person who can enter and leave the room during the operative phase. 
Nobody can enter and leave the room otherwise. Once induction is performed and preoperative assessment has been performed, the patient goes into the operating room for adequate positioning. The circulating nurse, the charged nurse, the surgical team that's going to be involved, the anesthesia technician, and the anesthetist are in that room, and they don't leave until the patient is extubated. The chart stays in the surgeon's lounge. The chart does not move with the patient. As awkward as that is for everybody, it's the safest thing to do. And ideally, you should have electronic medical records. This is the time for electronic medical records to be put into play. Because handwritten charts, they will be an itis for infection. There is no way out of it. No way. You can't really sterilize paper. I mean, you could put it under the IR grill, but you can't really sterilize paper, right? The surgeons will go through the scrub room. Once they're inside, that's it. It's a one-way valve until they're done with the surgery. Once they're done with the surgery, the patient goes to the recovery room. From the recovery room, they will be transferred to the isolation ward. Their recovery room should ideally be a segregated room designed for that type of patient. If the patient is stable enough to not require any invasive ventilation, well and good. If they need any invasive ventilation, they should go straight in for that. Okay. These rooms in an ideal situation should be negative pressure isolation rooms. We'll talk about that in a second greater detail. So what can you wear inside and outside of the OR? So as you're transitioning into and out of the operating room, shoe covers, gowns, and gloves need to be taken off. In that order. As you're entering and exiting the anteroom, the cap, the eyewear, the N95 mask, or the PAPR should be taken on and off. All right, the active respirator should be taken on and off. And once it's taken off, it's left for the cleaning team to come in and clean. Every single transition in and out of a room requires a complete workup and a complete on and off process. There is no way out of it. And you should limit these transitions. So in order to limit spread, you should limit transitions, meaning, number one, try and do most of the procedure in a negative pressure isolation room. That means that if your patient is in the ICU and it's a negative pressure room in the ICU, continue to put them in the negative pressure room, okay? And I did a previous episode on how to build a negative pressure room if you need it. Um, it's not hard for an engineer. It's extremely difficult for somebody who's not an engineer. Uh, I would buy your engineer a cup of coffee every day for the next like three months until this whole thing resolves because you're going to need them for a lot of stuff. The pathology specimens should leave with the patient. So one person transferring both the pathology specimen and the patient. The patients should have their own doors, their own line of sight, and their own hallway route. Only the runner is allowed to enter and leave during the procedure itself. And they deliver things onto the trolley. They don't push the trolley into the room. They don't never enter the actual operating room. They enter the anteroom, and that's it. And when they enter the anteroom, they put things on a trolley. They holler up for the charge nurse. The charge nurse does her thing. Okay? Not a single trolley leaves any of the red area outlined prior until it's cleaned. Not a single piece of equipment leaves unless it's going to get sterilized. And when it does leave, it should be treated as something that's just as contaminated as the patient themselves. Okay? And the cleaning commences right at the end of the operation once the patient is at the bedside and you know that you do not need to get back. It's not when the patient is cleared. It's when the patient's at the bedside that the cleaning commences to increase the efficiency of the cleaning process, okay? And this whole process will take an hour. Recognize this. It has to be very clear in your heads that there's an ordered functional process that everybody is buying into. When you're dealing with the pathology specimen, it has to be double bagged. It has to be handled in full PPE. And everybody handling it should use full PPE. It should be handed to the pathologist either at the end of the day in one direct run from a sealed container or handed while the patient is leaving in unison so that there aren't multiple trips involving contamination and the area that's involved should be decontaminated later. All pens to be used should be discarded. Any touchscreen surfaces should be covered with cling film. Okay. 
leave the paperwork outside and get your hospital to invest in that EMR that you guys always wanted but could never get. Your decontamination process, give them at least an hour. Give the individuals involved at least an hour to do it. More disposables equals quicker cleaning time. It's all about teamwork and use different agents for different things. The agents that you should consider, you can use chlorine-based agents for stools, tables, floors, furniture, services, etc. Virex 256 for anything that's reusable. Now, the thing is about the Virex 256 is people think that it's a patented solution. It is. The, the actual Virex 256 is. But if you ask anybody who does regular decontamination work, the alternative is just as blue. And it's just the blue vat that, that they all use. And you're seeing them. I'm seeing them more and more these days, even on the streets, being used to wash cars out of paranoia. But that's what it is, okay? Then there's the micro zip for the screens. Alcohol can be used for goggles and eyewear. And we use Cydex for, for surgical equipment in general. Uh, but any sort of heavy scrub type of solution. IR can be considered. It has not been proven with the coronavirus, though. Remember, you're going to use up at minimum two hours on this, okay? So the remainder of your procedure has to be handled with urgency. It has to be handled like an acute care procedure. And you can only do this with people who are willing to opt in, willing to drill it, and willing to debrief. So bring in your A-team, okay? And these guys have to know that you're going to keep them safe and that you're going to stay safe. So lead by example. Don and off between contacts and encounters before you even do your first try run while you're rounding on patients. Wash frequently and limit access. And get to know your infectious disease, guys. Get to know the team that's dealing with the corona patient early, okay? So you develop a consensus. Again, I keep reiterating the point. If you're listening to this, you're a resuscitationist or work in acute care, chances are. Whether you're wearing your anesthesia hat, uh, emergency physician hat, or a surgeon's hat, I don't care. And I don't think that you care. This is what we're built for. We're built, we're built for these quote-unquote disasters, right? We're built for the chaos. We're very good at actively dealing with this stuff. And they're relying on us to deal with it, which means that we've expressed this expertise before, right? If you're being called to operate on these patients, I, I would contend that your chief of surgery knows that you're the right person for the job, right? They know it. There's no way out of it. Why are they calling you otherwise? Okay. So good luck. Let me know if you have any questions and thank you for listening. And please, please, please subscribe and keep the topic suggestions coming in.